Amen. I want to read the word of God from the book of Nehemiah, chapter 12. You might need to consult your table of contents to find Nehemiah. There's no shame in that. But go to Nehemiah, please, in your print Bibles or smart devices, Nehemiah chapter 12, beginning the reading at verse 44 from the New King James Version of the Scriptures and concluding with verse 47. And at the same time, some were appointed over the rooms of the storehouse for the offerings, the first fruits and the tithes, to gather into them from the fields of the cities the portions specified by the law for the priests and Levites. For Judah rejoiced over the priests and Levites who ministered. Both the singers and gate gatekeepers kept the charge of their God. And the charge of the purification according to the command of David and Solomon his son. For in the days of David and Asaph of old, there were chiefs of the singers and songs of praise and thanksgiving to God. In the days of Zerubbabel and in the days of Nehemiah, all Israel gave the portions for the singers and the gatekeepers a portion for each day. Mm -hmm. They also consecrated holy things for the Levites. And the Levites consecrated them for the children of Aaron. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. You may be seated. Thank you, musicians. Thank you, thank you for all you do. Thank you, AV folks. I've titled this, A Charge to Keep. I have. Last week I watched an NFL films presentation. It was a behind the scenes look at head coach Bill Belichick and the 2014 season of the New England Patriots. In the film, coach Belichick talked about what he expects from his players and coaches. Belichick does not expect his players to be perfect. He said that in the film. He does expect them to run, extend plays, rush, block, run moving routes, run crossing routes, make decisions, execute. The title of the film is Do Your Job. I like that. If this text in Nehemiah were a game, a sports game, allow me to introduce the team. We have priests, Levites, singers, gatekeepers, and chiefs of the singers, all listed here in this short text. They all had specific roles to play in the worship life of Judah. Priests did priestly things. Singers sang. Verse 45 is key. Let me read just verse 45 of Nehemiah 12. Both the singers and the gatekeepers kept the charge of their God. Everybody kept the charge of their God, according to the commandments of David and Solomon, his son. You could look at chapter 13 for an assignment list, what each was to do. I read from Nehemiah 13, beginning at verse 10. I also realized that the portions for the Levites had not been given them. For each of the Levites and the singers who did the work had gone back to the field. So I contended with the rulers and said, why is the house of God forsaken? 
and I gathered them together and set them in their place. Then all Judah brought the tithe of the grain and the new wine and the oil to the storehouse. And I appointed as treasurers over the storehouse Shelemiah, the priest, and Zedok, the scribe, and of the Levites, Pediah, and next to them was Hanan, the son of Zakur, the son of Mataniah, for they were considered faithful, and their task was to distribute to their brethren. Did you hear it? Nehemiah urges the priests and Levites to do that to which they are assigned. And then he assigns treasurers and people who are responsible for, responsible for distribution. Did you hear it? I want to observe two movements in this text in Nehemiah 12. First, appointment. What is it? If we were to fast forward to the Second Testament, Appointment here in this text is the equivalent of a person identifying and then implementing their spiritual gift. It is the what I'm supposed to do with my life question. In Nehemiah 13, we read of Nehemiah appointing treasurers and distributors. Those appointed gave themselves to their task. They were appointed. Do you have a sense that God has appointed you to a specific ministry? I hope so. It's what gets us going in the morning. It's knowing what we're supposed to do. I'm all in favor of improvisation and spontaneity, but not every day all day. You can't wing it every day all day. At some point, you have to know when you put your feet on the floor in the morning, to this I am called, and then go out and do it. Did you hear it in the text? There were some who were appointed over the rooms of the storehouse for the offerings, treasurers and distributors, verse 44. And at the same time, some were appointed, appointed, appointed. And what does this appointment lead to? To what does this giving of oneself to one's appointment lead? I'm glad you asked. The effective fulfillment of one's appointment leads to widespread joy. I can testify, I am living in joy because I know exactly what my appointment is. I know my purpose, I know my calling, I know my spiritual gifts. I know like I know my name, that at the end of my life, I'm going to be judged on how I proclaim the gospel, biblical truth, verbally and through music. That's, that's what ministry God gave to me. That's what I'm supposed to do. Everything else is gravy and side interests, you know, flying planes or enjoying playing Scrabble. That, that's side stuff. But what I'm called, my appointment is that I'm a communicator of biblical truth using verbal witness and using my music. That's what I'm called to. That's my appointment. Hey, how about you? Do you know what God expects of you? Do you know that on which you're going to be evaluated when it's all over? Appointment. Note the second clause of verse 44. Uh, let me just break. Well, let me read all of 44. And at the same time, some were appointed over the rooms of the storehouse for the offerings, the first fruits and the tithes, to gather them from the fields of the cities, the portions specified by the law for the priests and Levites. Judah rejoiced over the priests and Levites who ministered. Judah rejoiced when they watched the, the priests and the Levites doing their jobs, fulfilling their appointment, using their spiritual gifts. They were encouraged and made joyful. And when you do that to which you're appointed, other people are blessed by it. There is joy all around when we are aware 
of our appointment and operate in our giftedness and in our appointments. But there's a second movement here in this text. First is appointment. Second is perseverance. Those that had been appointed kept their charges. I love that line. Verse 45, both the singers and the gatekeepers kept their charge or kept the charge of their God. Did you hear it? That is, they did what they were appointed to do and they stayed at it. I, I want to suggest that perseverance might be the demonstration of our appointment. Anybody can stay in ministry for three weeks. I want to know if you can do it for many years. This text celebrates longevity and consistency. They, did you read it in verse 45? Kept the charge of their God. In fact, they saw their assignment, which might have been given by Nehemiah, but ultimately they see it as given by God. And they kept their charge. And the charge of the purification. That is, they kept their task and, and kept at it. The first clause of verse 45 suggests that the charge was not only human, but was divine as well. For by the time they start framing it, they frame it as perhaps an assignment given by Nehemiah, but it's the charge of my God. It's the calling of my God. I'm the pastor of the Crossroads Church on the southwest corner of Panola and Redan in the city of Stone Mountain, Georgia. I was hired by this church to be its pastor. There is a human element. A pastoral nominating committee interviewed me. We went through a lot of steps and meetings. I had to fill out paperwork. There, there was some human involvement. But ultimately, I minister knowing that I am called by God and charged by God. Listen to this text. Nehemiah appoints people, there's an appointment, but it is human and divine. They kept the charge of their God, not simply the charge of Nehemiah, who calls them to go do this or that. I want to remember that ultimately I report to God. This ministry, this appointment, this using of spiritual gifts is ultimately played out before God. They kept the charge of their God. Huh. What a great reminder. These priests had charge of the purification rites according to the command of David and Solomon. However, their charge was ultimately the charge of their God. It's right in the text. I was so excited to read this and remember this. What a reminder for you and for me. The work we do is ultimately not only for the Crossroads Church. We do not only work for the city of Atlanta or for a, a certain hospital or a corporation or manufacturing plant. Ultimately, we work for God. You work for the county, you work for the state, you work for the federal government, wonderful. But ultimately, it's the charge of God that keeps you focused, keeps you doing what you do. My mother was sharing her frustration over a mail carrier who came to our house last week to deliver a package. My mother lives in an apartment building, a co-op building on the 18th floor in the Bronx, New York. Sometimes when a person has a package in that building, the mail carrier, instead of putting it in the mailbox, will take it up to the resident's apartment as a courtesy, perhaps. My mother was annoyed because the carrier went all the way to her apartment on the 18th floor, did not ring the bell, my mother was home, did not ring the bell, left a note on the door, you have a package, and then took the package away and back to the post office. 
And when I visited her, I was annoyed because the package was small enough to have fit in my mother's mailbox. But now she had to go to the post office and retrieve the package. And when I heard the story, I blurted out, I just want the mail carrier to do his job. That's all I'm asking. I'm not asking for any special treatment. Just do your job. You're supposed to carry the mail. Why inconvenience a 90-year-old woman by making her go to the post office when you could have put it in the box? Or if you're going to take it to a door, ring the bell and, I don't know, leave the package there. Do your job. That is what is expected of every singer, every gatekeeper in this text, every Levite, every priest, I might add, every Bible study leader, every worship planner, every janitor, every office manager, every bus driver, every teacher, every assembly line worker, every airline pilot, every landscaper, every plumber, every salon, salon owner, every barber, every counselor supervisor, every political, every salesperson, every news anchor, every manufacturer, do your job. <laughs> yeah, I said it. It's so simple. Here were people appointed and they did what God called them to. Let me wrap this up. Leviticus 8.35 reads this way. Therefore you shall stay at the door of the tabernacle of meeting day and night for seven days and keep the charge of the Lord so that you may not die. For so I have commanded. And commenting on that verse, Matthew Henry wrote, We have every one of us a charge to keep an eternal God to glorify, an immortal soul to provide for, needful duty to be done, our generation to serve, and it must be our daily care to keep this charge, for it is the charge of the Lord our Master who will shortly call us to an account about it, and it is to our peril if we neglect it. Keep it that ye die not. It is death, eternal death, to betray the truth we are charged with. The hymn writer Charles Wesley, 18th century Methodist hymn writer, penned more than 8,000 hymns. He read that commentary by Matthew Henry and then penned the classic hymn, A Charge to Keep I Have. He, reading the comments of Matthew Henry on Leviticus 8.35, then wrote, and we're going to close with his hymn, a charge to keep I have, a God to glorify, a never dying soul to save and fit it for the sky, to serve this present age, my calling to fulfill. Oh, may it all my powers engage to do my master's will. Arm me with jealous care as in thy sight to live and O oh, thy servant Lord prepare a strict account to give. Help me to watch and pray, and on thyself rely, assured if I my trust betray, I shall forever die. Uh, interestingly enough, just before we sing this, uh, the, hymnist, the, the hymnology scholar, Fred Geely, notes that there have been several attempts to soften the final lines of a charge to keep I have. Those final lines, as Wesley wrote them, are assured that if I my trust betray, I shall forever die. Some uh, hymn book compilers didn't like that. So one version reads, and let me ne'er my trust betray, but press to realms on high. Wesley wrote, assured if I my trust betray, I shall forever die. The British Methodist hymnal, published in 1983, altered those two lines like this. So shall I not my trust betray, nor love within me die. 
Wesley wrote, assured if I my trust betray, I shall forever die. Then Geely says this, the, the hymn scholar says, the alteration of these lines weakens the intensity of the hymn. The gospel always comes with both threat and promise. <laughs> if I don't keep my charge, I shall die. But if I keep it, I shall know the joy of the Lord. Those of you in the sanctuary,